What's up everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to another video. Uh, I'm Ryan Beach and in this video, we're gonna be going through an article that a friend of mine sent me that was written by Noah Kagayama. For those of you that don't know Noah, he writes for the Bulletproof Musician blog and he also does the Bulletproof Musician podcast. I think he writes really, really great stuff. There's tons of useful information. So if you don't know about that blog, you should go check it out. We're gonna be talking about this one blog post in particular as it relates to perfection in our practice sessions. Many of you have heard me talk about trying to be as perfect as you can in practice sessions to develop as many good habits as possible. And so even the title of the article is gonna bring some of that into question. And so I wanted to share it with you because I think the article is a really important thing to consider. And then I just wanted to challenge it with some of my own ideas. Before we get into the video, I did wanna say that this is something I'm really interested in doing. So if any of you out there have articles that you really like that you'd love some of my thoughts on, send them my way. and. Uh, I would love to look at them and make a video about some of my thoughts. Let's get into the video. The title of Noah's article is, Is Perfect Practice As Essential A Thing As We Tend To Assume It Is? And the opening goes like this. When you were a kid and first started playing an instrument, you probably made all kinds of mistakes during practice, quite cheerfully with not a worry in the world. But as you got older and more experienced, you may have become increasingly wary of doing things, quote, wrong worrying that if you made mistakes in practice, those mistakes might end up happening on stage too. And sure, at some point it is important to get things right more often than we get things wrong, but this idea that we must minimize errors in the learning process, is that really so important? Does perfect error-free practice really maximize learning or could perfect practice actually hinder the learning process in some way? So right out of the gate, I'm really interested in what he's gonna be saying in this article because that's why I think we should try to be as quote, perfect as possible in our practice sessions because I really believe if we're ingraining things in the practice room, those are the things that we should expect to happen on stage. So I'm kind of interested to see what he's gonna have to say that might challenge some of what I believe. So later in a section where it says, where did this idea come from? Noah writes, this idea that errors in learning could lead to bad habits and problems with performance in the future seems reasonable and it wouldn't be surprising if it were true, but is it? Like, where did this idea come from? Is there any research which found this to be the case? And Noah just goes on to talk about how in the 50s and the 60s, there was a bit of research that seemed to support the idea that doing things incorrectly would lead to the formation of bad habits. And it was actually, he writes, was um, supported by a study done on pigeons to try to get them to peck in a green or a red circle, whichever one they wanted. And Noah was saying that this is one of the key studies that has influenced us to adopt this style of thinking in terms of perfection versus making mistakes in practice. And so that's pretty interesting to think, what if a study on pigeons has influenced us all the way down here and maybe we were wrong? So we're gonna skip down to the header two approaches to teaching math, where Noah writes, Metcalf describes a study where researchers videotaped eighth grade math classrooms in various countries and compared the teaching methods in these classrooms. And then they went on to note that one of the comparisons that was made was between the United States and Japan. They saw that Japan had higher math scores and so they were interested in the differences between the teaching styles between Japan and the United States. And it looks like the key difference between the two was that in the US classrooms, teachers typically taught by showing students the correct way to approach a particular type of problem, then the students practiced the correct methods and the correct error-free answers were reinforced in praise while errors were minimized. To contrast that, in the Japanese classrooms, the students were asked to try to solve problems first before being taught how and expected to struggle, try a number of incorrect approaches and make a lot of mistakes. But the initial struggle was followed by a lot of discussion of the errors and incorrect approaches, why they might have chosen those approaches, why they didn't work, and what the correct method is, and why that leads to the correct answer. Noah goes on to talk about a study that was done on five-year-olds. And very quickly, this study was basically, they were trying to get the five-year-olds to organize things like buttons or things like candies into different rows and things like that. The three groups of kids were divided into how they got feedback. So the first group got right and wrong answers. You're right or you're wrong. The second group was asked to give their own reasoning behind why they did the certain things. And then the last one was the kid gave their answer. They were given feedback, but then the researcher would say, well, how do you think I knew that? And the kid was responsible for trying to think basically like the researcher. And the study showed that the ones that tried to think 
how the researcher would problem solve were far and away more successful in being able to learn and to get better over the period of time that they were being studied. So it's pretty hard to refute this evidence. The idea that these students who struggled and they made mistakes and then they were sort of helped along by the teacher being able to explain how the right answer is come to, they have a lot more intricate knowledge of how these things worked. I wanna to touch on one more thing he said in this particular article, and then I wanna kinda of move into some of my own thoughts. Under the heading of Remember This U Texas Study, Noah writes, of course, at least for motor skills, it's not like we wanna make errors willy-nilly like it doesn't matter, because at some point it does seem to matter that we get things right a greater proportion of times than we get wrong, as in this University of Texas study with pianists. But as long as we're getting corrective feedback about our errors and fixing them, that's a very important but, of course, it doesn't seem we have to be quite as paranoid about practicing perfectly as we may fear we need to be. So this is a pretty big thing to mention in the middle of this is because one thing that I think is lacking from all of the evidence done in terms of math and in terms of these five-year-olds is that they're not doing a motor skill. They're doing something that is specifically knowledge base, right? But when we practice an instrument, it's not just knowledge base. Yes, we have to put our knowledge into it, but it is a motor skill. We're actually ingraining how we want something to work over and over and over again. And so while mistakes can help us, it that very big butt he talked about, if we don't have a way to understand how to interpret the mistakes and learn from them and grow, then we're just stuck making mistakes over and over and over again. And that's really where I believe the majority of musicians are. No one may know a whole lot of different musicians than I do. And so maybe there's just people I haven't met that feel this way. But my experience is not that people are very afraid to make mistakes. My experience through working with others and actually in my own career is that we're more likely to make mistakes or make errors and then actually think it's not a big deal. I don't really need to worry about that. It just happened this time, next time it'll be fine. This is where I start to argue for trying to raise the standard of our playing, the quality of our playing and our practice sessions so that it can be reflected on stage when we're performing. In general, I agree with what Noah is saying. I think it's a very important thing to recognize that our mistakes and that struggle is how we learn. But if we, again, do not have a way to interpret the mistakes, we're stuck making mistakes all the time. I actually think this is where a lot of limiting beliefs come from. This idea that I have struggled with this for so long, that's just not something I'm good at. This is something I haven't struggled with. That's something I am good at. Moving on to Noah's conclusion under the heading of takeaways, he writes, I can certainly remember times when I wished my teacher would just give me the answer and tell me the rationale so I could just do the right thing and move on. But I do have to confess that having to struggle through the process of at least trying to figure things out for myself, even if they ultimately shared the correct answer and rationale with me afterwards, did seem to force it all to sink in more deeply. Sort of moving past that, he writes, and at the end of the day, yes, the goal is to minimize errors in performance, but the research seems to suggest that we don't need to have a zero tolerance policy for mistakes in the learning process because preventing or minimizing errors during training may actually hinder learning. As errors at this stage of skill development, given the right sort of feedback and reflection on the underlying whys can be useful in enhancing the learning process. For my own conclusion, what I feel like I'm missing from this article is an actual application, not just a takeaway, but an application. I think he's right. I don't think we have to be afraid of mistakes, but to try to take some of my experience and give it to you for how we would interpret those things, the most important part of being able to interpret your mistakes mistakes and be able to learn from them is having a strong mental model. Some people will call this a blueprint. Some people will call this hearing the sound in your head. There are different ways of describing the same thing. When you have a strong mental model, no matter how many mistakes you make in your particular practice session, you're gonna be able to say, I made these mistakes. How is that different from my mental model? And what do I think will move me closer to the mental model? I would liken this to something like a GPS. If I gave any of you an invitation over to my house and I said, I'll see you at seven o'clock tonight, but I did not give you my address, maybe you'd get lucky and maybe you would find your way to my house. But if I would have given you the address, 
you would have been able to just put that in your GPS and you would have had no problem getting here. The mental model or the blueprint or whatever, that is the address. That's the thing saying, I know where I'm headed. Having that allows you to begin to compare the work you're doing with where you want to be. And that's where we really start to be able to interpret these mistakes. I'm making them for this reason. I need to move more towards this mental model. I know what that's like and I can do it. In my own practice sessions, I'm not really that afraid of making mistakes. What I am is very careful to tolerate how many mistakes that I don't take seriously and try to improve upon. I do agree with Noah's premise. I think he's absolutely right. And I appreciate his effort to try to legitimize and to validate the struggle we need to go through to learn and to grow. I just think we should all be really careful to make sure that we don't take an article like this as license to say, it's totally fine if I make tons of mistakes, it doesn't really matter because that's how I learn. All right, everybody, that's gonna be all for this video. I really hope it was helpful for you in understanding how we might utilize mistakes in our practice sessions to be able to grow without trying to get it too carried away and possibly ingraining bad habits long-term. If you have any questions about what we talked about, I would love the opportunity to chat with you. I'll leave a link down below for a free 30 minute chat and we can talk about your practice sessions. We can talk about some of the struggles you're having, how I might be able to help. And if you wanna become a client to learn my approach to practice independence and things like that, I would love that opportunity. So if you wanna talk, click the link below and let's chat. Thanks so much for watching the video. Always remember, stay strong, be kind to yourself, never stop growing, and we'll see you in the next video.